Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung, Earth Lits, and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host, Molchar. And uh, Happy New Year, he said in February. Uh, hopefully you had a good Christmas and New Year and uh, endured everything that 2023 has so far thrown at you. Um, going to be a great year, lads. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to be back. Um, this is now, I promise, definitely regular programming. Um Thank you to everyone who uh, fed back on the uh, Alan Grant uh, tribute for Christmas. That was very much appreciated. Um, great to see such an outpouring of, uh, of not just grief, but, but warmth and love for, for him and his career. It's uh, really, really touching to see. But uh, new year, new broom. So uh, we're going to be launching into a new schedule of uh, programming for your aural sensors this year. Uh, this week, we are kicking off with an interview with Jonathan Stroud. Now, um, if you're not into your uh, YA or your uh, fantasy novels, then you might not know who Jonathan is. But if you've seen Lockwood & Co on Netflix, then you will definitely know who he is because uh, that is a series based on his award-winning and very popular series of YA fantasy books. Um, we had an absolutely fascinating chat um, about the influence of comics on his life, his career, the way he writes. Uh, we talked about um, how time passes differently when you were a kid, uh, about um, how uh, Joe Cornish, who is a, a Squawks Deck Thargo of some renown, uh, adapted the series uh, for Netflix. Um, a really uh, fun chat where we, we talked about British comics broadly uh, and, uh, yeah, how important they are. So I uh, hope you look forward to that. We're going to be back in two weeks' time with a very, very special guest, which is me. Um, because uh, as anyone who follows me on social media will know, I've got a book out in uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, make sure you pre-order I Am The Law, How Just Dead Predicted Our Future by one Michael Molsher. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's going to be a surreal experience where I get interviewed by somebody else on my podcast um but uh we've got some great announcements uh coming up for uh, this year so please keep your eyes peeled if you're not subscribed to the 2080 thrill mail then please go along and do so right now it's 2080.com forward slash thrill mail that's all one word um uh, particularly because on the 19th of february it's our 46th birthday, not mine, 2080s. And uh, so we're going to have a special newsletter uh, packed with uh, free downloads and uh, special things and competitions and stuff for you to uh, to get your mitts on. So, uh, yeah, uh, look forward uh, to that. Make sure you sign up. Uh, and uh, don't forget to pick up some of the titles from the uh, first part of this year, including the critically acclaimed um, omnibus edition of The Ballad of Halo Jones. It's beautiful, beautiful hardcover, uh, available in slipcase edition, he said, going over and grabbing his copy. Now, you can either get it in the standard edition, which is also very beautiful, or exclusively from our web shop, you can get the slipcase, which is absolutely stunning. Um, some great design from uh, Emma Sheldrake, uh, one of the designers at uh, 2000 AD. And this is the uh, colored strip, um, colors by uh, Barbara Nascenzo. Uh, there's new introduction by Kieran Gillen. There's uh, stuff in the back, such as uh, not reprinted before um, interviews and sketches, um, Alan Moore scripts, so you can actually see how the master writes. Um, all in all, absolutely stunning, stunning package. Um, so I encourage you to uh, head along to 2008.com, uh, 2008.com and get your copy. He said, destroying his desk. And also, a very British affair. Showed you the back first before the front. Uh, this is all for people on YouTube, by the way. Apologies to those of you uh, uh, listening um, 
to the podcast app of your choice. It will be very dull, but I do encourage you to uh, get hold of a copy because um, this is the Slipcase Edition. Absolutely stunning book, created by David Roach, who did the Eisner nominated um, uh, Masters of British Comic Art the other year. And it's all just these classic romance comics from uh, the heyday of the British romance comics industry. Absolutely stunning stuff. That's also available both from uh, 2008.com and uh, the treasury of British comics.com. So those are two big titles that we've had out this year. Um, but uh, also, and this ties into something we're going to be talking about in two weeks' time, um, Best of 2000 AD. Volume 2 is out now. Volume 1 was our best-selling title from the end of last year. Um, had to go to reprint before uh, it even uh, reached shops. Um, and that, again, critically claimed amazing feedback, perfect for new readers. If you've not picked up 2000 AD for a while do start with this series it's tailor-made for new readers um and uh, we're going to be hearing next week uh when, uh, two weeks time um uh, a panel from new york comic-con where um, some key comics critics talk about 2000 ad best of 2000 ad and uh, what a great package it is so looking forward to that now that's all the corporate messaging out of the way. So let's get on with this interview. Like I said, it's with Jonathan Stroud, the uh, award-winning author of the Lockwood and Co. books. And we talk about uh, the influence of comics on his writing, um, the Netflix show, absolutely fantastic. So uh, yeah, look forward to that. And um, like I said, we shall see you in two weeks time for Huzzah! More from <laughs> the Galaxy's Greatest Podcast. And until then, Earthlets, Splendid Verthric. So I, I, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome Jonathan Stroud onto the 2080 Thrillcast. I, I mean, first off, congratulations uh, on uh, on the success of the uh, Netflix adaptation of uh, of Lockwood and Co. Um, how how are you feeling about? It? I mean, it must have been a whirlwind over the last couple of weeks. Oh um, it, well, it has my yes. No, no, thank you very much for having me me on the show. Absolute absolute uh, joy to be here. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a wonderful uh, experience the last couple of weeks. We we had the launch of it maybe maybe sort of ten days ago, and mm. and since then the show has it seems to have done really well. It's a, people it's got had a great uh, reception. It seems to be doing well in the in the, in the charts of, uh, globally, uh, and. It's not something I've ever experienced before. Being generally a, a chap who sits in his in his uh, little little office scribbling away with a few pieces of paper and, and a computer, you 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 all, it, all, all my excitements are in my own head, and um, suddenly it's all it's all it's all coming at me from outside, which is a which is a wonderful a wonderful feeling. I mean, it must be quite surreal. Um, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you've 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 uh, you've been involved up to a point with the, with the production that you know you've talked to Joe Cornish and you've you've um, you've seen it taking shape, but it must be still quite surreal to actually just see it on a screen. It's a very profound um, and and disconcerting thing. I, the the moment where I sat down in this uh, in this little sort of movie screening room and watched the first episode. This is back mm. I think back in. Uh, October or so that they they showed me the first episode and I was I was really quite nervous you know I was quite kind of keyed up I knew it was going to be good because I knew that the guys who did it were good I knew the actors were brilliant I knew the amount of effort they put in I I I didn't really have any anxiety on that score but you still don't really you don't really know and and then the, 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 I was just there story the storytelling hit me and within about five minutes I was kind of like a punter I was just I was just sitting there smiling away enjoying enjoying the, the the story as it was was thrown at me but actually seeing the, the most profoundest thing was see, was seeing the, the the actors who were embodying my my characters so well just up there on the screen at this vast scale mm. at me and, and and they were just there three in a three-dimensional way that was that was a very strange um uh, experience second second only perhaps to the point where a year or two back when they they were they built the they built the Lock, Lockwood's house um, uh, in uh, in Ealing Studios, and I, I I went along and kind of went inside the house because they it, on the outside it looks like a big old uh, wooden box, but when you when you when you went inside, it was Lockwood's house, and it was it was like you were in a proper uh, London townhouse. It had all his stuff and all the rubbish and incredible detail, and it was incredibly close to what I saw in my head when I was writing the book. That 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 was an extraordinary moment. I really did feel like I, I'd stepped inside my own my own story 
Because I, I, I guess for for anyone who's who's been the, the the kind of keeper of the of that image, you know, it's your image. You you've created it, and the the other people, third parties, have translated that into actually something you can physically walk around. Yeah, I mean, I, I come back to the word surreal. <laughs> it's, it must be such <laughs> so, uh, kind of was was there a, a, a sense of I don't know whiplash of. A, a kind of disorientation of like, oh, wait, no, wait, <laughs> this is real. There, well, there was a moment when I kind of stepped over the threshold and the, the, the people who were with me were sort of waited behind me. I'm like, oh, well, well, come on, are you gonna, you're going to walk into it. And actually, I, I, I was just sort of stationary because, yeah, you, you, you suddenly have this, this sense in which um, everything has shifted, something that was internalised, um, that, had, that had a particular reality. And as you know, I mean, as... You know, all, all creative acts. You are formulating your own reality, and, it, and it, it, it it exists within a within you know inside your head or on the page, or whatever. And then suddenly, it had it had kind of fl- everything had flipped round, and I was um um I don't know, like in a um Steve Ditko kind of other world type thing. Where you're, you're suddenly there, sort of standing on a tiny little little disc, sort of floating through space, and all around you are these kind of weird shapes and things. And you're yeah, it, it was a, it had a kind of psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in in those moments um yeah and then also you, you get you you come out and you get a sense of just how lucky you are that you have you you've been able to experience that that transition from mm. one thing to another it was, it was wonderful did you get a sense of uh people watching your reactions because I, I i remember when um uh, just before the dread movie came out in 2012 we were very fortunate. Uh, 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 the the small team that we have got invited to a press screening in uh, in Soho, and um, Alex Garland, lovely chap, you know, came up and greeted us. Oh, you're the guys from 2008, and and he went, I really want to know what you think because you know you, you you're the guys who uh, whose opinion I count. And we were like, oh yeah. no, <laughs> no, no what you do? We were like, are we going to have to run out of this place? When this is over, yes. you know, like leave before yes. the lights go. Did, did you have any kind of sense of that? Is he going to like it? What's he going to react? Well, I yeah, you get that moment where there was, there, there was a moment where 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 um, Joe and Joe Cornish and Rachel Pryor, um, our, our fabulous one of our fabulous producers, they 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 kind of welcomed me and my wife to the to the screening room, and they said, right, we're going to show you, we're going to show you uh, episode one, and. Um, We'll 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 sit with you for the first sort of couple of minutes. Then we're going to go off and do something, and we're going to come back at the end and find out what you thought. And so there was that kind of slight the loosening of collar moment where you think, well, what happens if I didn't? Again, as I say, I wasn't actually that worried about. I, I yeah. knew I was going to like it, but you still have this think of, okay, uh, will I have will I have a problem with anything? And it, it was it was it was perfect. I mean, it really, I came. I just the the lights came up, and I was sitting there with a silly grin on my face, and. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, it would be it would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? I'm sure you loved the the the, the Judge Dredd movie, did you? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely adore it. Look, you guys like, were safe. Yeah, blown away, um, and and kind of like a, a little bit shell shocked, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, when we when we yes, yeah, and particularly you know the movie's great and everything, but then um, and this is a digression, but uh, when the credits come up, literally yeah. the first credit was. Judge Dredd created by John Wagner and Carlos Esquerra. Um, um, that that was like I'd really enjoyed the movie. That yes. was the thing that blew me away. And so you know, I was I was uh, very very pleased to be able to give him a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like who the hell am I? <laughs> well, well done, acclaimed international director and uh, screen mighty. You know, you've well, done no, really well. I had that same. I had that same exactly the same sensation. It's really it's a strange one, isn't it? Um, mm. As a as a kind of as the I suppose the originator. Um, obviously, it's it, you know it's, it's it's good that I like it, but uh, but actually, what happens when you when you bring out a book or a comic or anything, you, you bring it into the world, and it it, it it then becomes something separate to you, and actually, it, its journey is, is 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 its own, and you know I, I might get run over by a bus, um, uh, and and yet the hopefully the story continues. So on one level, what I think of it is 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 irrelevant but um in this particular case i'm delighted that i'm able to just, you know enjoy tag along on the coattails of this beautiful beautiful um uh, production now one of the, uh, anyone listening to this so, so this is the, the um the kind of relaunch of the 2080 podcast we've we've kind of been off the air for a few months um because of life but um uh anyone listening to this or watching this uh might be confused about where why we're talking 
to you uh, about uh, on the 2018 podcast. But of course, in anyone who's seen the show will automatically see what the connection is, which is uh, uh, George uh, Karim, who's played by uh, Ali uh, Haji Hashmati, um, wears not uh, not <laughs> just just read 2080. He wears 2080 as well, and and you know there's a steel claw T-shirt that we supplied as 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 well. We we we. Uh, do do you do you know how that came about? Is is it Joe Cornish who kind of went? This is how it should be. Yes, I think I think so. I, well, I, I, it's actually a good question. I should have I should have found this out before coming on the podcast. <laughs> who, the, who the originator of this was? I mean, I know that Joe um, and 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 the team are they're, they're they're much they're much cooler than I am, and so they're, <laughs> they're much they're much more sort of tuned in to the. Um, in this case, they're much more tuned into the aesthetic of, of the movie that they were trying to create. And the whole point of the London Co series is that you're in this alternative present day um, London where an epidemic of ghosts, the uh, adults can't see the ghosts, the ghosts can kill you, only the young people who have psychic abilities can, can go out and fight them. So you have an interesting society where the, the adults are still kind of ruling the roost, but they relying on these kids who kind of almost like slave labor to go out and actually mm. fight monsters. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting world. But in, in my books, I, I didn't worry too much about the aesthetic of it. I just had the concept and that was great. Uh, uh, the first conversation I had with Joe and Naira Park and um, Rachel, they, they, they said, look, we've, we've really got to get, get the visuals right here. What, you know, what, what is this world going to look like? And it was beautiful, logical thinking that they, and, and it linked into what I, I was thinking in my head as I was writing it, that really what I was doing, I was going, going back to a world where the digital technical re revolution of the last um you know quarter of a century hadn't hadn't happened it's mm. everyone's obsessed with fighting ghosts all technology goes into into that so you don't have computers and you don't have mobile phones um and it's it's, it's just basically going back to the, the, the time of, of my childhood which is the same as the, the, of joe's childhood they're both about the same age um and so and so he very much focused on the idea of yeah we're gonna go for, we're gonna go back into the 80s we're gonna Give us kind of really good aesthetic. Uh, get the music from that period. We're going to get, um, you know, lovely cultural icons like um, 2000 AD um, uh, I, uh, uh, the logo. Um, and we, you know, we, we can use all this to give you this just this beautiful three dimensional sense of uh, an alternative, um, slightly retro London. And I wouldn't actually, I wouldn't have had a the first clue how to do that. So um, I'm afraid I can't take any credit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's it, it it's just it was so striking. I mean, you know, we 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 didn't see any anything other than like the early press images and the trailer and everything. Yeah. So seeing the stuff that we uh, we provided up there on the screen was was uh, you know very 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 gratifying. But you you it, it it's interesting the point you made that this this is not necessarily a retro world. It's just a world that's never really moved on. That's right. From the point of the the crisis where all, all, all the ghosts start um, uh, rising up and killing people, um, and I, I, I'm 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 interested to hear your thoughts on on the the meaning and role of uh, kind of our nostalgia, um, and how that plays out in a in a kind of wider cultural context. So you know you you you're getting a lot of TV shows these days that base themselves in the 1980s in that pre-digital mm. age because mm. an awful lot of the people producing this content grew up in the in the 70s and, and 80s. So I wonder I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um how things like you know putting something like the 2000 the old 2080 logo in there, putting a, a, a an old prog in there kind of plays with our minds and 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 draws us into this world because we go with well, this is both familiar and alien at the same time. Yeah, I think it's all, it, it's it plays into a, a kind of double um uh, a double so it's, it's a strategy about a doubleness I think that, that they they as a, a production team have and I as a writer also have I suppose on a sort of deeper level that um that the the books the Lockwood and Co books uh, and I think the TV show in, in its own way um we try to we try to create something that is both um unsettling a little bit edgy a little bit challenging and also kind of comforting and cozy and familiar and reassuring and you actually have the two of them fused together in quite what 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 you know what we hope is quite a quite a satisfying way um that's where that whole aesthetic comes in you know, you on the one hand you have a world 
where there are these familiar things and they and they 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 they, they link in certainly people of a certain generation they link into uh ideas of nostalgia and familiarity and um uh lockwood's got this house which he lives in with, with george and lucy and they you know they go around with their with their t-shirts and they drink tea and they biscuits and and it's their sanctuary but then when they actually go out they go out into into really quite an unpleasant london where there are lots of you know, uh, ghosts around who will who will try and kill them each night, and the adults are not are, are essentially hostile. And the, it, it's it's a it's a dysto there's a dystopian London outside. So you have this this kind of constant light and dark thing um, going on, and the 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 nostalgia thing is clever because actually the eighties going back to the eighties. Um, yes, there was lots of cool cool stuff going on, but it was also a pretty grim the whole sort of Thatcherite period. It was there's a it, the London and, and Britain was not necessarily in a great in a great place, and so there's a there's a kind of subtle commentary um, in this in this vision of London that they're that they're that they're they're throwing up. Uh, it, it's there for you to 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 key into if you want. You know, it's it's um that's that's, that's part of the fun of the show. You, you you embed as many things as possible into it, but you ultimately it's about uh, enjoying the the surface narrative, of course. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it just. Uh going on from, from your point about you know c- c- creating that kind of cognitive dissonance where yeah. things feel a bit creepy because they're, they're recognizable but alien at the same time yes. and you're dealing with ghosts as well which which in of themselves are you know uh the the, the past in the present oh, they are point. yeah you're right they're kind of walking they are they are walking nostalgia aren't they <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've I'm always said that. nostalgia could kill you but you know, <laughs> maybe not that bad. no that's right I didn't know about that. No, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all about past and present. I mean, the, the 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 two things kind of colliding the whole time, and it you, you can see it in the in the the, the, the detective story, you know, the books, the detective stories. That you're finding out why why is there a ghost coming out of that wall? Well, there's a murder. Well, who did it? And so you have all the, you it fuses in with in into the great British tradition of of detective stories and the great British tradition of ghost stories. Um, and it's it's a beautiful thing that they they've. Um, uh they they've put 2000 and day 2000 AD in there because um uh you know the, the the great sort of british comic tradition is 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 a is also a great influence on on me and on on all the other sort of the creator I'm, you know i'm sure if you grab joe and well, by the scruff of the neck and got him in here he he would he could talk to you about his his influence and and, and the comics would be very important years ago i remember being in a in a taxi in new york with i think it was charlie higson and um a couple of other authors, like really random. We were just going somewhere to, to some um, books fair or something. Yeah, we're all just just sort of in the car talking about our our childhood, and all of us started start talking about comics and the comics that we that we had loved and that had inspired us. And we're like, oh, okay, yeah, it was it was noticeable that um, none of us were actually comics creators. We we hadn't we hadn't grown up to, to to do that, but we'd all we'd all had that as an ingredient in our. Um, uh yeah in our in our gestation all right so perfectly this brings us around to to why i really wanted to get you on the uh oh, on, oh, okay. on the show <laughs> to, to, to talk about this influence of comics because you know 2080's appearance in in um in the tv series and 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 you know I, we could probably talk about the the um, influence of comics on TV storytelling and films and everything until the cast mm. come but i wanted specifically to uh, talk about their influence on you because um uh, read, reading up on on uh, uh your your life you had um a difficult period when you were a, 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 a child. you were born in 1970 you had a difficult period between when you were 7 and 9 that's right yeah yeah is exactly when 2000 AD launched um <laughs> you know in, in 1977 <laughs> so i kind of i saw that and i was like right okay i want to explore this. I, I i'd love to to uh, to hear from you what what this influence is, how how this came about, your memories of of reading comics, and how you think um, that that changed you and and affected you, and 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 maybe how it yeah. comes through in things like Lockwood and Co. Wow, well, it's a big it's a big old subject, isn't it? Um, it's true that I so I went on the on the on the kind of personal level, I went through this phase um, of basically being ill. I mean, I had lots of I was in hospital a lot and. Um, you know, repeatedly and, and in, in for quite a while so was, there, there were periods where I just essentially was just in a bed and I wasn't um you know I wasn't that, that I think I had pneumonia or something I wasn't actually I wasn't doing very much other than simply sitting there reading and of course um 
Um, and one of the things I remember about the hospital was that you had vast numbers of old album, um, uh, uh, you know, co comic albums kicking about, uh, annuals and um, things. And in general, the stuff that I read um, was on the kind of more um, sort of knockabout British comic uh, comedy tradition of. of, yeah. of so um, I, 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 I was a you know, I was a big Dino fan. That that was. A, kind of massive influence and then in the in the hospital i was getting all sorts of other you know wizard and ships all these all these all these kind of 70s um uh, uh annuals that, that that were just lined up so i would just sit sit for, sit for days essentially just just absorbing all of this um and and when i when i when i came out it sounds like i was out of prison but when i when i when i when i finally emerged into the light the the that that side of things merrily carried on so the the, the bino was a big influence um linking into that were were things like um, Asterix. Asterix was a huge influence on me. About the same time, I think, probably around the same time, my, my uh, people people brought me uh, Asterix books to shut me up. I was never a big fan of Tintin, or I liked Tintin. Tintin was fine, but Asterix is what, what what I enjoyed. And I think all these comics that I've mentioned, what was really what I liked was the combination of humour and the kind of kinetic um, a quality of of action and dynamism. Uh, Asterix, you know, looking at it, it you've got you've got the you've got the, the, the verbal um, pleasure of the jokes, but you also have a tremendous amount of movement, action, people getting punched out of the screen, and it's um, as a, as a kid, I absolutely um, ate that up. So that's been a massive influence on me. And when I, years years and years later, when I wrote my first successful series uh, about a genie called Bartimaeus, um, beginning with the Amulet of Samarkand, this is about twenty years ago. Um, I had this revelation that I was writing. I was writing this fantasy, and this the genie was kind of in, in all kinds of scraps, and he was fighting with other genies, and they were um, blowing each other through walls and things. And, um, and it, it, I, I would see it in my head very much, in the sense of a, of a, of a uh, like a, like a comic book. I would describe action in in a kind of sequential way. So um, fusion of comedy and action. Going, goes right back for me to to those early periods, and of course at the same time, I mean, 2000 AD was there, and I I, I used to read it, but not much. It's it an interesting one. I feel I feel very guilty actually, sort of coming on the podcast. So I kind of <laughs> might, you, you might this might be the end of the, the podcast actually because I I, yeah, I, yeah. I I was I was ex, I was exposed to it, but it, it it was it was always sort of vaguely on the edge, and I, I things like I, I read um you know Doctor Who Weekly and that sort of stuff. So I so I was kind of. I was flirting with mm. thing that was very different from all that kind of comedy stuff. And 2008, I was aware of it, but for some reason, it didn't. I never, I never really got into it in a in a big way at that at that point. Around about that time, uh, 10, 11, uh, some of my friends who were much more hip than I was, they 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 they'd keyed into Marvel, and they used to pick up these little. There were these little pocket books, uh, Marvel pocket books, where they reprinted all the old classic mm. Men, X Men. You know, I can't remember Fantastic Four, some some of the early classics um, from the from the sixties, and they were all reprinted in this tiny format, um, black and white. So basically, it was a really kind of rubbish experience in some ways because you could hardly read it, and you know, it was all very inky. But I absolutely ate that up, and I, I um, suddenly was exposed to this a different, a completely different strand of um, uh, of, of comic of, of comic art. So, yeah. But that's that's where that's where it all began. I mean, this is the longest answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. I, I, I mean, don't 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 worry that you weren't a big two thousand eight reader. It's because ultimately this is a comics podcast, and um, what I, what I find um, uh, fascinating is, is, is not just that two thousand AD has gone on to to, to influence uh, people like yeah. Jay Fox, but as you describe with that taxi ride. With like yeah. Charlie Higson, who's, who's you know uh, uh, was on the podcast a couple of years ago because uh, he, he he wrote. Did he um, talk about that about that taxi ride? I, I'm, I don't I don't recall him <laughs> doing so. I may not have asked the right question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's it, it's just how saturated British culture, especially, yeah. actually is with comics without us even realizing. Not not yeah. in a kind of um, not like American culture is where the superhero is so powerful, but actually yeah. where comics storytelling the ethos of comics the, the 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 kind of power relations the moral landscape of comics has had such a prof profound effect and and I'd, I'd like that kind of connection with Lockwood and Co that you know you 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 you've got these memories of 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 lapping this stuff up and then yeah. it emerges in different ways in in an, an adaptation from somebody 
who read 2000, you know, and, and shared that experience. I, I, it's absolutely well, I th- I, yeah, I, I think I think it's absolutely integral. So certainly, to, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what kids growing up today, they, they, they'll get they get sort of comic art thrown at them, I guess, in, in slightly different different way. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I mean, going into the supermarket, you don't get so you haven't got so many um cool comics um, on display so you, you, you okay great if you go into forbidden planet or something you're oh gosh comic you know you're you, there you can get all kinds of great stuff but you know if you go into the local news agents what what, what is there not maybe not quite so much as it was um back in the back in the 70s where you had so many different comics all sort of competing for the for the kids to come and spend you know 5p on it mm. um, but yeah the 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 end the, 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 there's definitely a um there's definitely a kind of uh, an efficiency, um, a a, um, a precision, um, a, a sort of a, a, a connection with obviously with visual um, storytelling, which which comics which comics embody, which is very very important when you're writing books like I am, which are I mean I write basically I write fantasy books. I'm kind of labelled I suppose young young adult, but I my readership are I would say between let's say twelve up to adult, so it's quite a broad broad. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the same as as the audience for for most most comics actually these days we would we would all agree that you know comics is a broad church everyone everyone reads them we there's no, there's no age limit to it um and, and and if you're writing stuff that for for certainly the, the things I write it's really important that you keep things precise and 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 uh, uh, and, and um and light on its feet which 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 basically comics teach you to do it kind of cuts the crap out and you're left with you're left with the with the essentials. Um, uh, I I always kind of refer back to some Italo Calvino did a did a book years ago about um, called Six Memos for the Next Millennium, and it had in it essays about uh, literary qualities that he that he reckoned were really cool, and there were things like exactitude and lightness and quickness. Um, <clears throat> and this is very much in, this is what comics are about. There they, they there is this lightness, this quickness, this sense that you can jump from one thing to another. Do, great sort of springs of imagination in, in one going from one panel to another um it's, it's, it's tremendously exciting and tremendously um empowering to have had that in your background because then you sit there going okay i'm going to tell my story I, I, I may be using words but i i can use the same principles i i, I can have my characters doing this and, and doing that and i can visualize it and i can just put it in very 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 briefly and and, and efficiently and it it's and, it, and excitingly I mean, the, the the key word for me there that you used was efficiency. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's been lots of studies about how comic books relate information in the most efficient way possible because you're, right. you're yeah. absorbing it on two levels. You're reading the words and you're looking at the pictures. And um, it, 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 it's, it's one of those things that I think is so undervalued in, mm. uh, um, in an awful lot of media. And, and, you know, there's big discussions in American comics about, hyper compressed and decompressed comics and how you affect time and all this and the other but wow. british comics always had that efficiency you yes. know you, you've, you've got a page to tell a, a mini the mink story or yes yes you know um a, yeah. a, a, the bash street kids have got a, a two pages uh <laughs> yeah. for something so you can't you can't mess around <laughs> no no that's quite right that's quite right and 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 the beautiful way in which and um, you, you're looking at a um, you know Leo Baxendale um, Bash Street Kids uh, page, and the way that you, yeah, you're right. There'll, there'll be the there'll be the efficient storytelling, and then within each picture, there'll be all kinds of incredibly cool cool sight gags, which are you you may not necessarily pick up in the first reading, but they're there for you to to enjoy in a kind of more leisurely um, in a kind of different way of reading. You, know, you go back and you can just hop hop around and enjoy the the, the, the beauty of the pictures. Um, and and I very I very much think when I'm writing I <clears throat> I try yeah, in, in a sort of different way but I'm trying to do the similar thing that you you want you want the story to be to be quick you want it to be to be exciting you want to turn a page and suspense and everything but then you also want to just put in these little extra nuggets and little little hidden things which which are there for people to enjoy if they you know if if they have the have have that uh, have the time or you know or the perception. I was I was talking to uh, a friend of mine um, about 
uh, time in comic books and also time in childhood um, that uh, when you were, it's, it's the it's the old cliche about childhood, you know, the the, the concept of the endless summer. And mm, when you, when you yeah. get to adulthood, all of a sudden days zip by, particularly when you're enjoying yourself, it seems to be over in a <laughs> blink of an eye. Um, but because, because time occupies uh, um, less of a poor, uh, 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 you know, children only have so much life that they yes. have gone through. So, you yeah. know, time occupies uh, yeah. less of a, a space. And, so coming uh, coming back to uh, what you were saying about the time that you were in hospital and just pouring yeah. over these books. Yeah. When you've got that kind of density of storytelling and you're a kid, that can sustain you for hours and days. Yeah. And it feels like forever. Um, whereas as adults, we're kind of, you know, get, 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 get to the end. Do, do you think that that, that control of time uh, is, is part of... Um, the uh the breadth of who you think your the audience for your books are that you know a, a, a kid can read it and yeah that yeah. you know that 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 book can feel like a, a much longer period whereas an adult can read it and you know see it in a different way you you're absolutely right about time and and um and 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 the age and I, and, and in fact one of the reasons why i really like writing for um you know again i sort of slight slight inverted commas but being a being a young adult writer why that is so is so cool and i think in a way it probably has a parallel with if you're a comics creator i suspect that i suspect a lot of comics creators would probably say a similar thing but you you are you're creating stuff which <coughs> is 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 likely to be to appeal to people at this key point where they are yeah just be, just before life starts getting complicated just before it starts sort of uh, it, it speeding up they're still at that point where you could so somehow spend an entire week sort of sitting on your bed reading some massive fantasy novel or or sitting reading your way through you know the collected uh, 2000 AD or you know whatever whatever it is and at that point the um it it it, it inhabits you in, in a in a in a way that's more more deep more 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 um life enhancing than than it would do if you read it sort of 50 you know 30 30 years later mm -hmm. um, and, and you, I, like like the Jesuits, you know, you get them early, you, you keep them, you, you keep them forever. Uh, if you can, if you can get a reader excited by your stuff at that, around that sort of age, then they they will carry your book with you they, with, to their lives, and that's a very you know that's a really exciting and um, uh, it's a great honor, it's a great privilege to feel like you you might be able to do that. That's, that's why it's worth that's why it's worth writing really good comics. It's why it's worth writing really excellent young fan, young adult stuff because. You know, this is this is stuff that's going to last, and it'll it'll be it'll live with people. Mm. Um, does that answer your question? I I do I do agree. I think that there's something about your experience there. Everything is much more, um, everything is much more deeply experienced when you are that age. Uh, so, curiously, that links into Lockwood and Co. Again, that my my characters who are all young, they're, they're all mid mid teens. Um, the whole point is that adults have lost that sensitivity to ghosts. So the adults the adults know the ghosts are there. But you know they're better, their their senses are dulled. They can't they can't they can't spot them. Whereas the young the children the the younger people still have that sharpness that sort of uh, sensitivity to to things. And I think that's true. Obviously not in the sense of ghosts, but I think it's true that when you are young, you are so much more alive to the sharpness and the weirdness and the the the, the vibrancy of everything around you, and that includes what you're what you're what you're reading. Um, so it's a yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great um, point in time to focus on as a creator. Do you think also that, that uh, you you've inherited any kind of the, the the moral landscape from the kind of comics you were reading? Because I'm looking at something like Lockwood and Co, where um, it's not just that the 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 the, 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 the kids are in a kind of indentured servitude, um, where uh, you know the, the system relies on them but undervalues them at exactly the same time. Yeah. And that, but there's a, a great sense, particularly with a, a, a character like Lucy Carlyle, of um, oh, and, and Lockwood as well, I, I, I guess, um, of uh, rebellion, of wishing to change things. And uh, I'm always struck reading um, 
comics from the 1970s and 1980s, actually how rebellious these things are. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> people, people I, I think an awful lot of adults either never read them or have forgotten just these aren't nice and safe necessarily. No. No, because there's a there's this fantastic moral landscape. I, I wondered if you you thought of any of of how that might have affected the 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 way that you, uh, the, well, whether you've kind of brought this through into the kind of characters that you enjoy writing. That's a really interesting question. I mean, I I I I always kind of shake my head in a in a kind of um, uh, old bugger type of way when I look at um, you know the beanos that my my kids would read. Mm. 30 years after the ones that I read and no and no doubt you know my my grandparents or parents would be looking at the ones I read and they'd be saying the same thing so you know it's always going to be a, a shift but um what always strikes me now is that in the in the Beano because you can't have you can't have you can't have corporal punishment you can't have kids getting getting whacked you can't have you can't actually have any real jeopardy or any kind of um uh you, you can't have justice inflicted on on the child at the end uh, in the way that you could you you still could in the 70s in fact by the 80s by the time i stopped i finished i think i finished getting the beano when i was about um i don't know 14 or something yeah, it was long i was long overdue but by that point you could kind of tell that they the slipper was being phased out and um and it kind of actually had it, it, it as a as a structural device it was really important that you had this the, the threat <laughs> the threat of violence to the <laughs> For the rebellious child, because because actually, it meant that if the if you could have all kinds of anarchy, the, the you know Dennis the Menace or whoever could do in, you know, <laughs> incredibly um, disruptive, chaotic, um, destructive acts, and in a way there was a there was a kind of moral justice that they would get uh, a whacking at the end, but actually um, you also knew that it would never quench that rebelliousness that there was. A, like a, it was like a, it, it's like an eternal yin and yang, an eternal sort of cycle between uh, authority and and youth and rebellion, and the two were kind of locked together. And uh, there was something very sort of satisfying about about that. And then, of course, when you're not allowed to do it anymore, so oh oh, Dennis, you 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 you've you know you've done this terrible thing to Walter, and um, uh, oh, uh, what, what what would it be like? You go up to your room or or. Um, you know, no pocket money for a week. It, it it sort of it loses it loses that kind of um, satisfactory dynamic. So goodness knows what it's like now. I mean, I imagine that um, it's probably no it's probably no moral element at all. Um, but I've, 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 I, don't, I don't know. I, I've got a few friends who, who, who write for the for um, the Beano and uh, the the di- the dynamic of it now is that the, there's there's still uh, that sense of right and wrong it's just okay. not, it's not necessarily delivered with that structure of retribution um <laughs> and i look i look i look forward to the uh to the newspaper headlines where you see you know lockwood and co-author um uh says bring bring back the slipper bring back the cane, yeah. <laughs> no no well look, obviously one wouldn't wouldn't want that but, but, but i well i know I, I do think it's a, i do think it presents a challenge for, mm-hmm. it presents a challenge because because it is it is it's yeah, you, you, there, there are there are complex ways. You're looking at it in two ways, aren't you? When you're reading a when you're reading a Dennis the Menace story or something, you're looking at it, you. On one level, you're thinking, yes, uh, the disruption uh, has consequences, and at the end, order must prevail again. But of course, as a as a reader, you're also thinking, no, this is great because actually, I I like anarchy, and I I want to overthrow um uh you know the the, the powers that be. And linking into your original question about um Lockwood and Co. The, 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 yeah, you're absolutely right that there's this. That all my books have this um, have this sense that you have the 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 political adult world, which essentially is quite uh, baleful, and um, the the heroes the, the, who are usually young are sort of trapped within it and trying to find a way to to escape. So um, you know, my 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 sympathy is always on the on the side of the of the of the of, of Dennis the Menace or Backstreet Kids or you know, Lockwood and Co. I, I, I want them to, I want them to break out. I want them to, to, to disrupt and to, uh, you know, to succeed in that, in that, in that disruption. And of course, getting cake, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> earlier on, you, you, hastily. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> well, earlier on, you, you, you mentioned about um, uh, how the, the, the setting of Lockwood and Co. is dystopian. 
um, and you linked it to the eighties, which uh, you know, uh, the, the things like two thousand AD were, were were such a part of the kind of the cultural landscape of the eighties because it it riffed off, reflected, satirized this this dystopia. Um, things are difficult at the moment. Let's. Yes, um, absolutely you know, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, let's underplay it slightly. But um, do do you think for 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 kids especially, um, works of art that 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 deal with themes of dystopia and crisis and you know um, social difficulties, but that center them in those stories. So it's not about adults dealing with the world but it's actually about them do you think that's important at a, at a time like this that the, the kids can identify characters who are, are like them but in a uh, in a similar kind of tough spot yeah i think i think it is important i mean i i'm i'm not one who you know speaking speaking for myself i'm not somebody who kind of settles down um to enjoy uh you know a big fat dystopian book um or movie you know i i I kind of find if something's really kind of depressing, I'm I'm not I'm not really I'm not really up for it. You know, the world is hard enough. Um, so what I try and do, I mean, it, in in some respects, I I sort of missold myself. I, I think I think all my all my books can be viewed as as having elements of dystopia. The, the uh, whether it's Bartimaeus's world where there are uh, it's a it's a sort of <laughs> I don't know fascist state run by magicians, and and in Lockwood and Co. you've got this you've got this epidemic of ghosts, and um, you there's so dystopian elements. But actually, what I think is very crucial with my stuff is I always try to um, to bring in um, uh, something to counter that, and you you counter it with, in my books with the uh, with the characters and the, the friendship between the characters and the love of the characters and the and by the end of the of the, the books you you've usually got a little gang of of characters who are um, whose uh, whose love and friendship is actually more than a match for the dark the dark stuff all around them and and for me that's really important I think that's that's actually the thing that I would want my readers my young readers or readers of any age to um, to 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 take away from it that that actually you yeah you fa you you look you you stand up you look into the darkness you look at the bad stuff and you you know you're not alone you're with you're with people uh, who, who will support you and actually you it, it will carry you through so I, I i do always feel like there is a there is a kind of moral uh, message there you know within within the text but um on the surface we're fighting ghosts and and making jokes and eating donuts and that's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's circling back to, to uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about at the very beginning is, is this is a world uh, in Lockwood and Co. where the digital revolution never happened, where it's still very much an analog world, um, even though it's a, 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 a contemporary world or more. Yeah. Contemporary world. Um, and I, I, I wonder how much that is is linked. Um, because from from a storytelling point of view, it's actually quite handy not to have mobile phones and the internet because people have got to go and find things out for themselves, and yeah, yeah. you know they can't necessarily immediately <laughs> phone somebody up. Um, but I I, I, wonder, I wondered how much of that was 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 tied into this sense of um, uh, it's a, a it it's it it's a not a more difficult world. But it's a world that just makes a little bit more sense. It doesn't move as quickly as possible. So actually, the kind of you know, you, yeah. you 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 have to solve things for yourself to a degree. Um, mm. uh, you know, it, it was 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 that a, a motivating thing for for you in in that setting, or or was it more kind of well, mobile phones are really easy to to use. <laughs> it, it's it's one of these things where you, you know, as a writer, you you. You, I think, to, to begin with, you don't think in those terms. You know, mm. you're thinking in terms of. Uh, I, I'm I, with Lockwood and Co. I started with the with this. Just little, I wrote I wrote a couple of pages. With just a kid, a boy, and a girl going to a knocking on the door of a house in modern London to fight a ghost. And they had they were they were modern kids, um, but they had they had swords and uh, you know kit to fight the ghost. And, and I really liked this little scene. I didn't know who the kids were. I didn't know why they they were doing this or why they had a sword particularly. I didn't know what the what the logic was. So the first job as a writer is you've got to you, you've got to 
uh, get that little exciting image, and then then around that you have to kind of create the world, which which the logic which will explain uh, why that is correct and why that isn't just some whimsical, um, you know, flash in the pan uh, image. So uh, I will I as you, as I went, I began to think, okay, this this is the logic of the world. It, and it would certainly help um, not to have lots of mobile phones because that then in, in immediately creates uh, a, a completely different dynamic. If you're in the in the trapped in the red room and you know terrible things are happening to you, you and you're on the phone to your friends, then then it, it's it's different from if you're cut off. So there were there were logical things that, and, but but you're right that actually by the time you finish and you step back and you go, here's my world. Um, yeah, you have created something which is which is kind of. Sl- slightly slower slight well obviously it's simpler it's simpler than the real world isn't it it's it's, it's going to be a um just a, a just a simpler more um artific- it's an artificial world the rules within it are uh, something that I, i've tried to create and and hopefully um it for the reader it kind of then reflects out into the real world and you, you as, like you say you you can you can take messages from it and you you can then turn it to to your own life as a, as a young person you think well i i can i can do things i can I can I can make a difference. I can do it with with my friends and my the community that I'm in. Um, uh, yeah. So simplicity is simplicity. I think with, with technology is good. Also, it doesn't outdate. That's the that's the other thing. If I if I put in mobile phones and stuff, you know that within five years it will just be antiquated. So better to avoid them. I, it, was, it was. I was watching a film from only about ten years ago, and we had a damn good laugh at the mobiles <laughs> that they had. In, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's just unsettling how quickly all that thing. <laughs> the, the, the thing that really struck me, I mean, not not just about the um, uh, the TV show, but also the book. It, it, the the idea of creating a believable world, one that works, one that has its own internal logic. Um, yeah, and 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 again, not not to keep kind of banging this particular drum. Um, you you mentioned something like Asterix, which you know, and 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 Wizard and Chips, and all, the, and all these have very odd. When you actually drill down into into yes. what the stories are, the the the, yeah. the, the, the uh, uh, you know, <laughs> they're creating believable worlds sometimes, which are unbelievable. Um, but I wondered again whether whether this is something that that uh, a, a, a skill, an influence, an inspiration that perhaps you picked up. Um, from your childhood, because it, and also you 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 um you've talked about uh, the influence of game books like the Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson yes. uh, oh, fighting absolutely. fantasy stuff, yeah. Which um I've never I never completed any of them. I just sat and read them. <laughs> because... yeah, well, when you say you read them, did you did you just sort of um you know would try one way, and then you'd go back and sort of um. No, no, I read them from beginning to end. Oh, did you? Mm, I was a very that's, odd child. Um, did, I, psychological I peculiarity there. Yeah, I didn't like suspense, um, so <laughs> I just wanted to know all, all the information. So I, I just read them. But in a way, that's yeah. very, that's almost cubist, isn't it? You're kind of creating this kind of you know collage. You, you see that you see the whole picture, but you're seeing it all at once in different. How 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 interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, uh, not, yeah. not 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 many friends. Odd child sat in the corner of the school library, but that's enough for me. You, I know what you mean, though, because. Yeah. Uh, that at one level you get those things and you think oh, this, is, this is so great and then part of you is there going oh but hold on a minute i you know i, I went left instead of right and and i never went to that picture with that cool minotaur and i i oh i wonder you know what have i missed and yeah so I, t- I totally know the uh, <laughs> yeah do, do, do you know what that's that's it that you've probably just hit the nail on the head there is those yeah. illustrations which were yes. fantastic and i'd see them <laughs> and go well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe try to do the, the the thing and die within like five pages, and I see the illustration. And I go, oh, I want to know what that's about. <laughs> that's right. That's great. There's a there's a, a great. Uh, we, play, we play a lot of um, kind of detective board games, and there's one called um, Sherlock Holmes uh, Consulting Detective, which is a very yes. famous uh, one. That's a great game. Yes, I, I yeah, and, and we've, we've we've you know. Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, and I and my friends, uh, we've we've been through so many of these boxes, and you get the the casings, and you're not necessarily going to go to it everywhere in the game, but you'll see yeah. you'll be flicking through looking for the entry that you're looking for, and you see this illustration, you just go, oh, I really want to know what that is. Yes, oh, how do we get to it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I that no, it's it's. I think if you if you're exposed to that kind of um, branching narrative. Mm. Uh, thing it's it's very it, it does throw up all sorts of fascinating um fascinating possibilities and and i i can remember sort of being in the car you know and i'd be driving along and i'd, I'd always be sort of thinking about this that obviously my dad or mum would be driving me in a certain direction down the road 
and I'd be looking out the side window, which of course as an adult you don't do so much because you, 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 know, you tend to be driving, but you know, I'd be looking out the side window and you'd see all these other roads heading off round corners, sort of into woods, past weird house, and and you'd be there just sort of thinking, oh, well, what happened if I went down that? You you suddenly you, you suddenly become aware of the the the, the branches of, of possibility, and I absolutely loved those. Um, uh, the, the Warwick of Firetop Mountain and all those um, fighting fantasy ones. They they really sort of quite profoundly affected me. And I spent quite a few... So when I was about eight, <clears throat> I guess probably in that kind of period where I was in hospital, <clears throat> I was m- majorly into writing comics. So I would make, I would make comics and I, I would spend probably a couple of years just making comics, um, writing and drawing them. That was great. And then when I, a little bit later, I discovered those um, books and I then spent probably the next couple, two or three years, my main focus was making um, uh, interactive game books. Mm. Um, and looking back on it, that was a massive, massive influence because they're quite complicated to do. But if you want to do it well, um, you, you're, you're, you've got to control so many threads and have things branching back. And you want you want to, you know, I try and draw little pictures and they all, I didn't want to have any gaps and, and no dead ends. Um, so it, it, it was a fantastic education actually in, in controlling uh, controlling a narrative or controlling multiple narratives um all fairly tedious because all, all tedious all fairly simple as in you, you're trying to get to the top of the tower and fight the demon and get the treasure it was all it was it was you know, basic stuff but actually i think it was a massive massive influence on me and now so looking back on it when i wrote the bartimaeus books about the genie bartimaeus um one of his things is he, he tells the story's first person narrative and he's constantly giving you footnotes, which uh, because he, said he, he thinks he's far cleverer than you. He's 5,000 years old. He's got all these little extra jokes to tell you. So there are also little footnotes with little extra bits in them. And I realized sort of subsequently that this was very much almost like doing a, um, uh, an interactive game book because you can ignore that. You can ignore the footnotes. You just read through it or you can you can go off down these little cul-de-sacs and you get the extra bits of information and then you go back into the text. And so being playful with narrative uh absolutely for me kind of comes back again to comics on one hand on the other hand the kind of the whole game book tradition amazing i mean we we, we live in the golden age of the footnote um you know because you, <laughs> you had terry pratchett's um uh footnotes yeah. jonathan strange and mr uh yes. and yes. you know, um so and, and it's it, it's wonderful to see because as you say you can just steam through yeah and ignore all that stuff. And it, I mean, I guess it comes back to, to what we're talking about with comic books. That the you know within a panel you've got multiple stories going. That's right. Yeah, you can, you can either you want, read them absolutely. all or ignore them. No, they're, they're very 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 similar. Um, so odd, oddly oddly similar. It's, it's very nice actually in the way that we're having the conversation that the, the, the two kind of you're bringing the two in because I, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about them, but I'm sure there there are all kinds of parallels. Mm. Um, for me, you know, when I, when I was eight, nine, ten, I if you'd asked me what I was going to do, I, I would have said, oh, I'd like to be a, be a creator for the Vino. I mean, I basically wanted to, I, I wanted to to be a cartoonist. I wanted to um, make my, you know, make comic strips. That was that was that was the thing. And it kept, the, the, the visual and the textual sort of continued with me for quite a quite a few years through into my mid teens. And at some point in my teens, I guess I began to uh, veer more towards words um and you know i i i I stopped sort of actually creating things that were visual but having said that all my books um are very very visual you know as in i will uh as is you know proved in the sense for me when i when i when i walked into the the house that the the guys had built on the film set Mm. they had built this this um from the description in my uh in my in my books and it, the, the description evidently was sufficient for them to be able to create it remarkably accurately. I mean, you know, it was really, and I know it's accurate for all the, you know, lots of the fans who people who read the books who watch the TV show. You know, no, no one is, I think, criticizing the the uh, the, the world, the, the the house that they're in because it because it's so it's so sort of well it's well done, and and that must come from the fact that visually I I, I try to make things quite precise in the. Um, you know, in my books uh, to this day. Well, I want to talk to you uh, uh, for a moment about George uh, Cubbins, uh, George Karim, as he is, as he is in the TV show. Um, yeah. I, I, and I, 
I feel as if in, in the TV show, uh, Joe Cornish is, is using him a little bit as a kind of avatar for that kind of geeky, nerdy kid who likes 2000 AD. And, yeah. You know, I don't yeah. want to get all, all freaking about it, but perhaps, you know, there's a little bit of Joe in him. <laughs> I wondered how much um, of of you was in was in George, whether that was a process that, that you've each individually done with that particular character. That's interesting. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I... N- Yes, definitely, George. I'm very, I'm very well. I'm very fond of all my in, in Lockwood and Co. The three main characters, Lucy Lockwood and George, and they're all they're all extremely different. And and the the the, the joy for me of writing it was that uh, that they they in a way they're all equally important. You know, Lock, Lockwood is the is the uh, it's his company. He's the kind of swaggering, uh, charismatic one, the one with the kind of um, you know lovely lovely smile. Everyone Lucy thinks he's great and. Um, so he's kind of almost like um, what you'd like to be if you weren't yourself, you know, because he's, <laughs> he's he swaggers around. He's really good at sword fighting. He's, you know, he's he's like he's what I would have liked to have been. Um, but of course, you're not like that. Um, and then George is actually, uh, and George and Lucy are both, in many respects, um, again aspects of myself. You know, I, I think you, you try and pour you, you tr- as a writer, you you try to put yourself into all your key characters. And yeah, absolutely, George. George was um, uh, is that kind of intent that sort of has that intensity and that kind of kind of he, well, he's very serious but he's also also very funny so he 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 very much links into what I suspect I was like as a kid so quite awkward socially um, really really passionate about what he's passionate about likes likes making sort of sarcastic uh, remarks um, in fact interestingly enough when I when 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 the show came out one of my old School friends um, basically collect, claimed that uh, that um, Ali, who plays George, is oh, he's just just like a young version of you. And like, no, I'm absolute nonsense. But um, you know, there, there were there were there were parallels that my friends my friends saw. She also actually is 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 an aspect of me. I mean, I, would you agree? I mean, surely all creators sort of throw they they put themselves into their key key characters, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I, if, if, yeah, um, there's all. The, by degrees, I think, yeah. and I, I, th- I think that the, 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 you can categorize some some writers, especially into um, them always wanting to be uh, Lockwood. Yeah. So all of their characters are essentially <laughs> avatars of how they see themselves as opposed yeah. to how they actually are. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and particularly when you get when you get anything that has an element of nostalgia that is grounded in a certain time period, mm. um, yeah, there's there's there's, there's always going to be self reflection in there. I'm sure there's a quote from like I don't know Plato or somebody about <sighs> uh, about putting yourself in your own work, but um, yeah. yeah, I I think uh, uh, yeah yeah uh, having having known an awful lot of of um, yes. comic book creators over the years, yeah. I think there's a a lot of uh, self reflection <laughs> or self projection let's put it that way in their way i'm no i'm sure that's right i think i think what was so nice what what feels nice and balanced you know when i'm watching the three guys on the screen with with lockwood um uh which is kind of which i think is very satisfying you know watching it as a as a as a consumer um is that the three characters are are all there complementing each other um they all they they all they all need each other they all they all different they all have their own you know uh, failings and their own foolishnesses and their own restrictions but actually all three of them are you know bring something to the party and they all and they all know that they they all they, 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 they they're constantly squabbling about making the tea or you know who's going to go into the haunted room first and all the rest of it but actually the they're yeah, there's no doubt they 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 know what what is the value of the other of the other person um and that that makes them i think a very satisfying unit to 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 get behind there's, whoever you are there's one one of them will either be will, will be close to you or have, have an aspect of of you mm-hmm. well it's uh, it's been really interesting so uh, seeing the reaction to the tv show of the, the 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 sheer number of people who've kind of copied two thousand, you know, tagged two thousand AD in a tweet or something, just yes. say, oh, you know, yeah. he's wearing a two thousand AD t shirt, <laughs> and it, it, it and it's so so much joy in identifying in that moment, you know, not yes. not necessarily a, a lock, stock, and barrel with the character, but just go, oh. yeah, that was what I liked, yeah, that's fantastic, and I, you know, to 
uh, coming back to what we were talking about earlier, like the, that that how um, the iconography of our childhoods um, can uh, be so impactful mm. and profound, and 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 I mean, it's always like a Proustian moment when you see stuff like this. You know, um, you're kind of taken back. So it's it's so fascinating to see something that's very squarely aimed. You know, the the characters are a particular age group. Um, you know the 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 the, the series, uh, although for all ages, um, is is characters that would appeal to that kind of age group. Mm. To also see adults, well, I and, think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a certainly as a um, uh, ever since I sort of began doing this, or twenty years ago, I always sat there thinking, I want to create um, a story which that I would have loved if I was. 12 years old and I found mm. it myself. but I also want to write a book which entertains me you know makes me laugh makes me you know gives me I, I want I want to do a book for, for me as a as a as a uh, as an as an adult and, and I still have that thing I, I'm I'm trying to see two um two, two sides two, two ages of me in my head at the same time trying to kind of keep the two keep the two together mm. uh, and yeah I think I think the, the, what the TV series does very effectively is actually ma- it maintains that you know you absolutely if you're young you've got those guys they they are they are your friends um, but if you're older you know you look at them and you 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 see an aspect of you from when you were young or, or you are as you are now um, uh, I, I think it is quite that's why it's quite powerful and why it's quite successful you know why people are liking it so much it's it, it does link into something that isn't really to do with whether you're young or old or, um, you know, boy or girl. It's, it's, it, there's, yeah, it's, it's I was going to say kind of, uni- it's kind of universal um, power there somewhere. I, I, kind of rounding off, I, I wanted to ask you what, what, what it was like working with Joe Cornish and the other producers uh, on, on, on the show. Cause Joe is a, a, a Squawks deck Thargo 2000 AD read. I think he had a letter published in 2000 AD decades ago. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, he, he knows all his stuff. Um, yeah. I, I, I wondered what it was like working with him. You said you, 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 you kind of similar age um, uh, and, and what that process would like, you know, particularly if there's anything that the show has changed that mm. wasn't necessarily in the books. Well, I mean, it's been an absolute delight working with Joe, Naira, Rachel, the whole the whole gang. Um, um, wh- why has it been a delight? Because they, <laughs> um, you know, they they came they, they came. I suppose they came to me first, having read the books and having a genuine, you know, love 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 for the books. And um, I came to them knowing that they'd done lots of really cool things that I that that, that in turn had influenced me. You know, I I, I was there watching. Um, you know, Naira, Naira did Spaced, um, uh, you know, what was it, a quarter of a century ago, whatever. And I, I, No, shut up. It was last week. <laughs> it's back to time again. It's moved, <laughs> all cruising on. But, you know, yeah, Spaced and Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and um, Baby Driver and then Joe, you know, Attack the Block. And you, you've got all these really, really um, seminal pieces of British um filmmaking where they take genres and they play with genres and they mix them up and it, they're really cool but they're also really funny and they're actually also quite scary or they're you know and you 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 put them all together so i knew i knew that they were kind of doing something in, in a similar similar to what i was trying to do in my own way trying to write books that had mi- mash up of different genres that did several things in in in, in, in the in the same on the same page and so i was i was i was very excited at the idea of of of, of a collaboration um and it was a delight i mean the first time i actually met joe we sat down we, we spoke on the phone and stuff but we, we I, I went into london and sat down with him and we kind of yeah but it's a bit a bit like our conversation now you know we started discussing what we'd like as, as kids and we we re- realized that we both have the same um Osborne book of ghosts i don't know whether you remember this it might you, you were probably much younger than us but you the you had the you remember it, not by it, much <laughs> <laughs> there were three in the, in the mid seventies. You had these three books. It was, it was called like Mysteries of the Unknown, and there was monsters, ghosts, and UFOs. There were there were three books, and they were they were the they were the coolest books. And, and the, the kid on the playground who had I, I got the ghost one, and that's yeah. still got it. And Joe had it as well. 
and the, you know we both were there we could remember all the different you know, scary photographs of you know the brown lady of Raynham Hall and all the Baldy Rectory and Oh, you know, and, and the Monsters One had really sort of terrifying pictures of people getting their throats ripped up by werewolves. And it was really, you know, you, I doubt you'd actually have that in the shop these days because it was so sort of graphic, but it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And so, yeah, we, we, you know, we instantly realised we had this kind of shared uh, mental landscape um, you know, behind us, um, which again, just sort of m- makes it easier to, to sort of trust trust the other you know you you know you're speaking the same language and you can say oh yeah the pandemic um i'm actually not going to set eyes on you guys for the, you know for the next year and a half we, we'll talk on the phone we'll exchange mm-hmm. but i i could feel my, myself I, I i felt confident in what they were and what they were doing um uh and and hope and they, they knew that they could give me a call if there's a problem or there was some issue they weren't sure about the world building or something i could i could throw my my hat into the ring and Give them give them some um, some advice that they could take if they wanted. So it was a very very re- very relaxed, very um, very painless through, through, the, through the whole process. The 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 the, the show has been very well received. Um, you know, number one in in many many territories uh, around the world. Um, but obviously, the, the 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 landscape of streaming content has changed quite a lot in the last year. Uh, alone um what's what what are the prospects for more Lockwood and co uh on the screen well i think i i, I think we we're we're kind of taking it a day a day at a time I mean, I, um it's, we only, it's only been out for 10, 10 days so it, in many respects it's um we're, we're very early in in the process and i i think everyone is um every, everyone is is just looking you don't really know what the figures are so you're 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 simply just trying to spread the word as much as possible um to as many different people as 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 possible um and the more people who talk about it the, the better it is and the, and the the more likely um we are to get a second a second season um you know it's been it's been a tremendous but I, I should mention actually that Net, uh, Netflix UK you, you know they're they're the guys who 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 were there with the with the, with the money and the uh, and the vision alongside complete fiction so it's been it's been this sort of shared um, passion for for people at Netflix as well. Um, we're, we're, I think we're all very proud of it. We're all very proud of, of what's been created, and I think we're just we're just now trying to throw it out there to to the world as as widely as possible, so that we can we can hopefully bring another another series if if possible down the line. Fantastic. I, well, I, I, I for one, absolutely enjoy it. And I know you, you always meant to say something like that, but I did genuinely enjoy it. I, like, I, <laughs> I, I, there's, there's, there's so much, um, there's so much stuff uh, uh, that kind of passes me by. And yes. um, I, was, I was intrigued with all the 2000 references and, you know, Joe, Joe Cornish, I know he's a, a, a reader of old. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll sit down and watch this. And the, the, there is just something about, I mean, I, I think I was, I was talking to a colleague who said, it's the show's slightly less gothic than the books um yeah. i mean I, I don't know whether you do uh, agree with that I, I think i think that's right i think it's i mean in a way they've made it cooler i mean as in they <laughs> the, well, the books i think the, you know, don't get me wrong i think the books the books are cool but they're cool in yeah in a kind of gothic yeah you can you can kind of tell that i that i was not you know i, I didn't read 2000 ad i was but i you know i was reading i was reading sort of mr james or or, or you know sherlock Holmes or something so you can kind of see you can feel the influences there and what's been great what's what's given the kind of breath of fresh air with with um with what joe and the gang have done is that is that they've brought their their own sort of power, similar sensibilities but then you know they they're just sort of slightly more they're slightly more with it you know in terms of you know cool music and um you know beautiful the the the, the aesthetic that they, that they that they bring to it yeah. is it in t-shirts you know to the fore um they they they're bringing something new to the to the party and that's that's the joy of the collaboration. It's 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 true to the books, but it's also something new in its own right. And that's that's uh, that's a wonderful alchemy to see. Mm. Yes, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Well, look, I I thank you so much for your time. This has been just a wonderful chat. Um, Thanks, Mike. No, it's been real real pleasure. Yeah, and I, I'm fascinated to not 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 just here obviously i wanted to talk to you about the influence of comics on the stuff but there, there is a kind of alchemy to this whole process isn't it all these different influences that kind of come in and it's it's so nice to see comics and 2080 in particular in the mix um with it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 no well i no real real joy to chat and um 
Let's hope we can do another one down the line at some point. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely.